Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of the hymns that we have talked about this summer during our little series, Songs in the Key of Faith, uh, are the ones that stir deep emotions or conjure up long-held memories. I'm willing to bet that if you have been here at St. John or have listened or watched the sermons on TV or the radio or YouTube any more than twice this summer, you've had some memory stirred up or your emotions moved deeply by one of the songs that we've examined or heard. I say this, of course, because today's hymn is number 787 on Eagle's Wings, and it is one of the most emotion-stirring, memory-rousing songs in the book. So if all of you turn there now, and Pastor David goes and turns the sound system on, I, I the floor switch, because I didn't do it again, yeah. I'll give you a little bit of the backstory of this hymn. On Eagle's Wings is a quite, thank you, contemporary hymn uh, being written by Catholic priest and songwriter uh, Michael Jonkus uh, during some combination of 1975 and 1976. Uh, it was first performed for the wake and funeral uh, of uh, Father Jonkus's friend Douglas Hall's father. Uh, and it is one of the sort of leading edge uh, of a wave of contemporary worship and liturgical music uh, that began to really come into its own in the 1980s. Uh, and this wave of music is well known for having decidedly un like uh, music. Uh, the lyrics, very traditional. The music, eh, not so much. Uh, so I'm going to prove that to you right now by playing two clips. One is from our song today, and the other is from a pop ballad. So, there we go. First clip. That's one. Now the other, as soon as it cues up, similar. Uh, the first one is from our hymn today on Eagle's Wings. Uh, the second was from Josh Groban's uh, You Raise Me Up. Uh, and the similarities do not stop with just the music. Uh, here are some of the lyrical parts. We'll flip-flop the order this time. You raise me up And now more raising up. And the similarities do not stop just there, and lest we become too male-centric, Bette Midler, famous balladeer in her own right, has a thing or two to chip in on this particular front. Now, I do not make all these comparisons just because it's fun to play music, uh, although it is. I make these comparisons uh, because they reiterate the point that I've been making ever since I got up here and started talking. And that it's this hymn and these songs are 
emotion stirring, the connections between them uh, only heighten that point. In fact, I've probably seen more people uh, get emotionally stirred up by songs like uh, The Wind Beneath My Wings or You Raise Me Up, then perhaps I see people get emotionally stirred by church hymns uh, every now and then. But that's what music does, is it stirs the emotions and it moves the soul. These ballads do it, certainly. This hymn does it, and today's hymn does it acutely well. Now, you may also remember me saying that On Eagle's Wings was written for a funeral. Uh, and I'm guessing that if you find your memories stirred up or your emotions moved because of On Eagle's Wings, it's because you heard it at a funeral because it's the perfect song for funerals. Although, because the meter is irregular and a bit challenging, it is often sung as a solo. But these words are just perfect for that occasion. Look at the hymn there in your hymnal and imagine people gathered together in the shelter of a holy house of prayer and worship to grieve in the company of God's holy people and hearing these words. You who dwell in the shelter of the Lord, who abide in this shadow for life, say to the Lord, my refuge, my rock in whom I trust, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. Yes, this hymn speaks to people experiencing grief. It speaks of resurrection. These words lifted more or less straight from today's reading from Isaiah and also Psalm 91 remind us that God is with us even in the saddest moments of our lives. Even in those times when we might feel very much alone. It is as if God himself reaches out to us in those places, those valleys of the shadow of death, and says to us, That is Jerry and the Peacemakers, covering You'll Never Walk Alone, which of course is originally from Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel. But it is exactly the words that God would use to remind us of his omnipresence in our lives. God doesn't only go on the prescribed track. God goes with us wherever we go. And God would, in fact, sing, you'll never walk alone to us if God were inclined to make his point via show tune. Or perhaps also if God were a fan of Liverpool Football Club, which plays soccer in England, and whose supporters, for whatever reason, sing You'll Never Walk Alone together before every single match. Now, before that excursus to the world of English soccer, uh, we were talking about funerals. Because the words of On Eagle's Wings give us assurance, as from God himself, that we will not be orphaned or abandoned in those difficult times of life, that we will never be snared by the fowlers that would catch us, that even though thousands fall around us, disaster will not come near us. But as long as we're talking about funerals and difficult times, I'd like for us all to get real comfortable for a bit and talk a little while about death. Because death can be a scary thing. Simply the inevitability of knowing that it is most definitely probable that each and every one of us will die causes great trouble and anxiety from time to time. It was exactly this, the fear that they would die before the second coming of Jesus that caused the people of Thessalonica to write the Apostle Paul with such great worry and exasperation that he had to respond to them twice. And that was nearly 2,000 years ago. And death remains a scary topic for us today as well. 
Perhaps it's because medicine has advanced to the point where it seems like prolonging human life is a foregone conclusion, something that is just going to keep happening and happening and happening. For example, as I told the kids, I'm getting old. I turn 32 weeks from tomorrow. Now, if I lived in late medieval England, even if you discount the high mortality rate for very young people back then, having made it this far, I could reasonably look back at my life and say, well, that's half over. Now, the average life expectancy today in the United States is almost 80 years. And because we're living to be older and older, and because then death tends to be something that happens in nursing homes and hospitals and not a present reality in our lives, death winds up being something that we don't confront until it hits just a little too close to home. And then it scares the dickens out of us. Maybe it scares the dickens out of us because we have heard the message of contemporary American Christian culture. The message that speaks of fire and brimstone, that speaks of condemnation. The message that reminds us, as Paul writes in Romans, that the wages of sin is death and that hellfire and damnation are God's answers to the sin of unrepentant human beings. Well, as it turns out, that message isn't quite right. It engenders a fear of death based on a fear of sin, and friends, that death, the death as the result of sin, has already occurred. In the waters of baptism, as Martin Luther once famously preached, we have already died. To quote Luther's words, such is the result of the death of Christ into which you are baptized. Christ has died and has commanded you to be baptized in order that sin might be drowned in you. The wages of sin may in fact be death, but that bill has already been paid in full. The death that sin would have us die, the condemnation and death of alienation from God, the death of hellfire and brimstone has already been done away with, and because I'm guessing you were baptized as an infant, you probably didn't even know what was happening at the time. You see, God's answer to sin is not to call for our damnation. God's answer to sin is resurrection. It begins with the resurrection of Christ. As Luther preached in that very same sermon, eternal life is already begun in you. God in baptism has already raised you up as though on wings like eagles. God has borne you up out of death on the breath of dawn. And you too in baptism are promised a portion of that resurrection on the last day when the saints of God will shine like the sun held in the palm of their heavenly Father. So when we sing this song in just a minute here, or when you hear it again at a funeral or at church. Don't be surprised if you find your emotions stirred up. Don't be surprised if old memories come floating to the surface. And when that happens, remember your baptism. And the resurrected life of Jesus Christ in which you share and in which you shall share for all time. Because that resurrection is God's answer and final word on sin. Thanks be to God. Amen.